Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Well, I'm sorry I can't be there with y'all in person, but I appreciate the opportunity to be here, be there virtually to talk about smoke management and air quality um, when you're doing prescribed burning. So as mentioned, my name is Melanie Petrollo. I am the Regional Air Program Manager for the USDA Forest Service Southern Region. So that is basically from Virginia to Texas. And as part of my duties, I am um, responsible for evaluating air quality impacts from Forest Service activities, including prescribed fire. Um, my background, however, was not always in fire. I used to be an air regulator working closely with EPA when I was working with the state of Virginia and the state of North Carolina uh, Departments of Environmental Quality. So I kind of come at this from a perspective of balancing the needs of air regulators to protect public health while also balancing the needs of land managers to implement prescribed fire so that ecological benefits and other um, benefits to reducing fuels and preventing catastrophic wildfires can also occur. So I'm, I'm gonna talk today about some of those things. Um, and I also just wanna let y'all know, even though I work for the Forest Service, we're all cooperators here. So if, whether you're with a state agency, whether you're a local landowner or a um, private entity, um, if you have any questions or wanna talk about smoke management, dispersion modeling, any of the things that I touch on today, feel free to reach out. I'll have my contact information on the last slide. And Eric or Mary Nell, if there are any questions in the room, can we just hold them till the very end and hopefully we'll have a, a time for some questions? Yep, we can do that. Okay, great. All right, so let's get started. So I teach a lot of smoke management classes around the country. And so when I was tailoring today's talk, I wanted to um, think about what are some of the most pressing questions or topics that come up around smoke and air quality when I'm listening to land managers, burn bosses, um, and these classes. So today's talk is really going to be divided into three basic categories. The first one is how to develop and foster good working relationships with state air quality agencies and EPA and understanding our different roles, which I just touched on. The second topic will be um, ways that we can talk to our communities about smoke, both before, during, and after prescribed fire events. And then finally, I wanna talk about um, assessing the health impacts associated with smoke from fire. And we're really gonna to touch on dispersion modeling and prediction tools that are available to you on the web that you can use to predict where your smoke's gonna do it, go, how it's going to behave, and how we can use those modeling results to communicate to, um, to the general public. So the first thing I wanna ask, and, and I, yeah, I can't see the room, but I wanted to ask, have you ever had a conversation with your state air regulatory agency? So I guess that would be Georgia EPD um, about prescribed fire and air quality. So even though I can't see you, by a show of hands, how many of you have had a conversation with the state air regulatory agency? How many of you have not had a conversation with a state air regulatory agency? And then the last um, option is, I don't even know who I would contact. Um, I don't know who that is. Now I can't see the room, but I imagine that there's quite a number of you that are in that last category. And if you don't know, that's okay. Um, but you should find out. And I wanted to bring this up because I think it's important and will become even more important in the future um, as standards get strengthened, which I'll talk about um, in just a minute. It's going to be important to engage and partner with your air regulatory agencies um, so that we can communicate with one another and understand our, our respective roles in 
all of the stuff that we do. So before we dive further into this topic, I want to highlight what EPA, that's the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, has said about prescribed fire. This is from the preamble to EPA's 2015 Exceptional Events Rule. Many of you have never heard of that, and that's great. That's good, good news because you haven't had to use it. But it is a tool that EPA has provided to flag or exclude uh, monitoring data that has been impacted by smoke from prescribed fire. So here's what EPA said. EPA has continued to express an understanding of the importance of prescribed fire, noting that it can be used to mimic the natural process necessary to manage and maintain existing fire adapted ecosystems and or return an area to its historical ecosystem while reducing the risk of public safety and the risk of uncontrolled emissions from catastrophic wildfires. So I like to point this out that EPA has said that and, and genuinely understands the role of prescribed fire because I think there is a sense among many on the regulatory side um, and on the land management side that we are not working towards the same goals. I kind of disagree with that because I think that um, EPA understands what EPA and states understand land management activities, and we should understand the, the importance of protecting public health. Um, we do need to understand that EPA and state regulatory agencies, their charge is to protect public health from air quality concerns. So that's, that's what they're doing. And land management agencies, we are charged with managing land for ecological benefits, as well as to reduce fuels to prevent catastrophic wildfires. We just have to balance both of these considerations, which is what is shown there on the right. So the title of this presentation is Where There's Fire, There's Smoke. Well, what's in smoke? Um, so in a perfect world with Perfect combustion, the only things emitted from a burning of any fuels would be carbon dioxide and water vapor. Um, but we don't live in a perfect world. And in reality, there's all these other things that are emitted from, from fire. Um, that includes carbon monoxide, particulate matter, volatile organic compounds, uh, uh, nitrogen oxides, and then some toxic air pollutants like benzene, acrolein, and other things. So carbon monoxide is a really important pollutant for the frontline workers on a fire. Um, however, it does dissipate rapidly. So from a community health standpoint, it is really not of a concern. What is most of a concern from, um, from wildland fire and prescribed fire is this PM 2.5. These are the really tiny particles that can travel deep into our lungs and cause a lot of health concerns. Now, just to reiterate, carbon monoxide is still important. And if you are working on the front lines of fire, um, you might be asked to wear a CO monitor, your burn boss may be asking um, or, or monitoring um, you for CO exposure. And if you wanna talk about, for, about that further, please reach out to me or to others that are um, really focused on firefighter health and safety, because that is a, a huge concern. It's not really the, the topic of this, um, of this presentation. We're talking about community um, impacts, but I wanted to let you know that CO is, is pretty significant for um, firefighter health and safety. So we're gonna talk about PM 2.5. Um, so, how many of you, by a show of hands, have heard about the National Ambient Air Quality Standards and this proposal that EPA um, set forth in January of 2023 to strengthen those standards? So I imagine there's quite a number of you in the room who have heard about that, but I'm, I'm just going to back up a little bit and tell you why they are doing that and um, what the process is. So Congress, U.S. Congress, established the Clean Air Act 
Um, and the Clean Air Act requires EPA to set, set health-based standards for certain air pollutants, including PM 2.5, particulate matter in all of its forms, but especially in that PM 2.5, the very, very small particles. Um, so again, Congress, it's, Congress requires EPA to do this. These standards, also called the NACs, the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, they are set to protect the most sensitive populations. So that would be the very young, the elderly, and those with pre-existing health concerns. So those with asthma, those with COPD, things of that nature. So they're set to protect the most sensitive populations, and they are required, these NACs are required to be revisited every five years using the most recent peer-reviewed scientific published research. So Congress says, I'm gonna set standards, you're gonna revisit them every five years. EPA does that, not necessarily on that time frame because they're a little slow, um, just like many of us <laughs> in uh, federal agencies. Um, but they have recently in January of 2023, proposed a revision to the PM 2.5 NACs. So the current NACs, as they stand now, there's a 24-hour standard and an annual standard. EPA has proposed to keep the 24-hour standard as is, but they've proposed to strengthen the annual standard um, down from 12 micrograms per cubic meter as a concentration um, to a level between nine and 10 micrograms per cubic meter. So that's quite, um, quite a reduction that they're looking at. So the current air quality monitoring data, so that's shown on the right of your screen. Um, it's kind of faded out to the West because we don't care about the West right now. We're just focused on the East and specifically Georgia. Um, current air quality monitoring data shows that quite a number of counties would not meet the revised standard at either a nine or a 10 microgram per cubic meter on an annual average. However, there's no need to panic at the moment because there are other on the way and on the books, that's, that's, a, that's the very technical term that EPA and state regulatory, regulatory agencies use to identify um, regulations and rules that are either currently in place or will be in place to reduce emissions from a multitude of air pollution sources. Generally, we're talking about reductions at factories, at power plants, paper mills, and on mobile sources. So that would be on your vehicles. So there's on the way and on the books rules that are going to reduce emissions to such a point that by 2032, most counties, EPA projects that most counties would meet the proposed air quality standards. So that's, that's a good thing. You still see on your map here that an area around Atlanta would not meet the standard and therefore the um, George EPD and others would have to look at other reductions in that area to reduce emissions so that the area would come into attainment or meet the standard. So given the, the, the reduced PM 2.5 standard and other things um, that are coming down the pike, what are some ways that you can interact with state regulatory agencies and or EPA? Um, I like to quote Ted Lasso <laughs> because Ted Lasso, is just, I love that show. And one of my favorite scenes is when Ted talks about being curious, not judgmental. Um, and what I, what I think that means is to understand that each agency um, whether it's EPA or Georgia Environmental Protection Division or Georgia Forestry Commission, we all have our separate goals. So we need to learn to communicate by not just talking about what we do, but listening to what they do as well. Um, so some ways that we can do that is understanding our roles. Um, and I mentioned that earlier, this balancing act of protecting public health and also doing burning for prescribed, I mean, for ecological benefits. 
So I like to say, let's not speak in jargon because, and yet I probably do speak in jargon, but I try to be cognizant that not everybody understands jargon from an environmental standpoint or from a land management standpoint. So understand that environmental engineer like me, um, when I came to work for the Forest Service, you know, I didn't take a lot of ecology classes or forestry classes in college. And so therefore, you know, my, my background as an environmental engineer with a state regulator, regulatory agency was burning is bad because I'm getting calls from the public about somebody burning their trash in their backyard. You know, that's really my experience with burning prior to joining the Forest Service in 2008. So we're not fully, you know, air regulators, they're not fully aware of all of the things that goes into prescribe, the prescribed burning program. And at the same time, maybe land management and burn bar, land management agencies and burn bosses, um, they may not know about atmospheric dispersion modeling and ways to predict where the smoke's going to go and what the concentrations are going to be. And the same goes with the public. Um, we don't know what we don't know. So it's important to communicate and listen. So one of the things that I've talked about before with folks is developing, you know, a, a 60 second elevator speech uh, so that you can communicate when you, when the opportunity arises for you to call Georgia APD or whoever, talk about what you do from a very basic standpoint, um, and then open that at the end of your elevator speech, open it up to how can we how could we go forward? What are some things that um, I don't know about that you do? So now we're going to switch um, to building up that public support, to building up that support to um, not only with air regulators, but also to the public. So the first question I'm gonna ask related to this is what is the role of social media? Do you think social media is a good forum in which to communicate upcoming prescribed fire activities um, and potential smoke impacts to the general public? How many of you think that's true? And how many think it's false? And how many are gonna hedge their bets and say it depends? So I think it depends. And the reason I think that is going to be illustrated by this case study that I'm going to quickly go over. So I'm gonna illustrate how important it is to gain and maintain public trust, especially in the age of social media. So I wanna quickly go over this case study. It's a real life example that took place down in Texas a few years ago. Um, and it's, it's in no way meant to disparage our friends at the Fish and Wildlife Service or at the Rancis National Wildlife Refuge. It's just simply to illustrate how important it is to communicate and to be proactive um, in the age of social media. So back several years ago, the Aransas National Wildlife Refuge planned a prescribed burn. Um, they had 4,000 acres, grasslands um, for wildlife um, habitat improvement. And they posted on Facebook, I believe it was, this photo along with the text that's below it that says, um, if you see a column of smoke, be aware that our prescribed fire crew is conducting a grassland prescribed burn on Matagorda Island today. Our primary goal for this burn is to improve habitat for whooping cranes next winter. And the drought has given us ideal conditions to achieve the best results. So what are some things that strike you about this social media post? Um, for the sake of time, we'll talk about it more, maybe if we have time at the end for questions, but rather than listening for questions, I'll just tell you some things that I've heard in the past and that I think strike me. First of all, I think that the picture may be a little bit alarming, even though it is smoke and, and you know, we're talking about fire and we want to show fire. Perhaps there should have been like two pictures, one with what fire is going to look like, but then what the end result is going to be, maybe a picture of the whooping crane. And the second thing that I think is interesting is the use of the word drought in the last sentence. Drought conjures up a lot of negative emotions with the general public, especially when it comes to fire. Um, so there's the, the agency saying that the drought is given them ideal conditions may have been a little bit questionable, but on the, on the positive side, they said what they were gonna do. They said why they were gonna do it. And they 
um, said what the benefit's going to be. So kudos in that way. All right, so later on in the day and into the evening, some news reports, well, the general public started calling and there were news reports about smoke significantly inland. So here are some of the headlines. Large controlled burn in Matagorda County produces smoke and haze seen across multiple Texas counties. Um, and there was this headline, controlled burn in Southeast Texas is tracking smoke all the way to San Antonio. Well, that's, you can see from this map here, you know, Matagorda Island's on the coast. Um, San Antonio is pretty far inland. Um, and yet there was smoke being felt and seen all the way into San Antonio. Well, the National Wildlife Refuge saw these headlines and what do you think their response was? It's not ours. Has anybody ever seen that before? <laughs> So the Facebook post page for the Wildlife Refuge posted an update about the fire and smoke concerns, and here's what it said. It said, our burn was completed late in the evening. The Matagorda Island is located pretty far south of San Antonio. If you are seeing and smelling smoke in San Antonio area, it is not from our prescribed fire. Okay, so they immediately said it's not ours. Well, then I guess they didn't have their, uh, they weren't communicating very well with their partners because then the National Weather Service posted this on Twitter. Um, if you live between San Antonio and New Braunfels and have stepped outside, you can likely smell smoke. Southeasterly winds push smoke from prescribed burn on Matagorda Island into the area today. Okay, and I'm gonna just blow up that satellite imagery. So you can see that here is Matagorda Island. Um, down to the, to, on, on the lower right of your screen. And that is a smoke plume going straight into um, San Antonio, pretty far inland. So what happened to that Facebook post and that update? It was deleted. Um, the original Facebook post received a lot of comments, a lot of reactions, many shares, but the Wildlife Refuge responded to all of the comments and provided information to educate those on social media about the importance of prescribed burning. So I just screen captured some of the responses. I blacked out the uh, names just to protect those who commented. But you can see that Arancis National Wildlife Refuge, they responding to, you know, hey, yeah, I'm sorry, that was my mistake to have posted that update that the smoke wasn't ours. I deleted it, so I didn't spread information. And then they responded to even the ones that were a little bit, um, for lack of a better term, a little nutty, um, you know, because on social media, folks will say, hey, was there garbage burning? I, I heard they were burning in a landfill. And they ran, Francis said, no, nope, um, there is no landfill associated with this burn. There were folks who were concerned about um, the, um, the little critters and what would happen to the critters as part of the burn and Rancis posted that as well. And then finally, they said, we understand that many of you have concerns about bur how burning affects wildlife. Here's a resource for you. And then they talk about how, what the benefits might be to the winter whip whipping frames, but also to the white-tailed hawk, the Texas horned li lizard, et cetera. So they responded, they cleaned up you know, that one post where it said it wasn't ours. So what are some lessons learned here? Well, really the lesson learned is don't be so quick to claim that it's not your smoke. There are times when this happened, uh, some, of, some of you in the room may remember the Atlanta smoke incident back in 2000, I think it was six or seven, um, where Atlanta was smoked in and Fish and Wildlife Service and, and the Forest Service both were burning that day, as was many people in the state. It was just a big burn day. Um, and there was a lot of finger pointing. Um, but but that's not it's it's our it's our it's our normal reaction, but it's not the best reaction. So don't be so quick to claim it's not our smoke. And then another thing that we can do um, to shift to the next part of the talk is to employ or utilize smoke dispersion modeling to help us really predict where the smoke is going to go. 
So my next question is, what do you think about this? Smoke modeling, also known as atmospheric dispersion modeling. Do you think it's always right? Do you think it's always wrong? Or do you think it's useful? So I never, I, I would never be one to say that smoke dispersion modeling is always right or that it's always wrong but it is always useful. It always will tell you something. And, and, and it also can, I tell folks this when I'm doing more extensive modeling classes, smoke dispersion modeling confirms your best professional judgment. If you have been in working in your field, working as a burn boss for a long enough time, you have a sense of where your smoke's gonna go. And you can communicate that to the public, right? or to your leaders or whoever you need to communicate it to. But if you have smoke dispersion modeling, it helps to confirm that. It helps to confirm and communicate what you, with your years of experience, already know. So dispersion modeling really is part of the um, overall smoke management objectives that most agencies, land management agencies, really want to employ. So the main smoke management objective is to minimize the amount and concentration of smoke that enters into our populated areas. Um, so we also want to prevent and minimize public health and safety hazards. So that might include impacts to sensitive sites such as schools, hospitals, nursing homes, things of that nature. And we also want to prevent or minimize the visual impairment or let's just say smoke on highways or at airports, both in the daytime and at night. Finally, we want to avoid violations of those NACs, the National Ambient Air Quality Standard. And just to let you know, if you're with a federal agency, um, with Department of Agriculture, one of our requirements is that our activities, no matter what they are, should not cause nor contribute to an exceedance of an air quality standard. So EPA has set forth six basic, well, I don't know, I'm going to take that back. Other there's generally six basic smoke management practices and EPA actually put these into their exceptional events rule. They didn't come up with them. Um, land management agencies came up with these six basic smoke management practices that have been identified um, and that we should follow in order to ensure that we are managing smoke and making sure that we are following um, our own guidelines. So if you have a state smoke management program, which Georgia does have, um, then the SMP that you all have, a state smoke management plan or program should cover all of these items. But I wanna go through the six items because it is important to just take a look at what, we're, what needs to be considered when you're doing your burn from a smoke management or air quality perspective. So the first one is evaluating smoke dispersion conditions. Then monitoring, we wanna monitor the effects of our burn on air quality, wanna keep good records. We wanna communicate, we talked about communication a lot lately um, and today. We wanna to consider emission reduction techniques. These were our burn techniques to reduce the amount of smoke, um, improve the efficiency of your fire. And then finally, share the air shed, um, coordination of area burning. So all six of these are important, but I'm really going to focus on three of those. So I'm going to talk about smoke dispersion conditions, monitoring, and sharing the air shed. So here is how we evaluate dispersion um, as part of that basic smoke management practice one. So before the burn, um, you want to identify smoke sensitive areas, areas that you want to avoid um, blowing smoke towards. What are your meteorological conditions? Do you want to do modeling? Um, and if you do, what do you want to use? Do you want to use B smoke or high split? And then you also want to obtain your air quality conditions. And that is through the airnow.gov site. And I'll show you a little bit more about that in just a bit. During the burn, we want to perhaps obtain updated forecasts, verify forecasts with observations, 
do you want to do additional for, uh, modeling based on these updated conditions? And we might, after the burn or into the evening hours, we want to assess our smoldering conditions. And then if nighttime smoke is a concern, we might want to do some nighttime modeling using an internet tool called PBP mod. Now, just to let you know, dispersion is also known as diffusion or dilution. And you might recall from grade school, you might have heard this term, the solution to pollution is dilution. And so what we're trying to do when we evaluate dispersion is how dilute your smoke is going to get um, as it travels towards populated communities. So to evaluate smoke, we can do daytime smoke dispersion modeling um, or screening. So many of you already do simple screening for your burns. Um, simple screening is done during the burn planning phase. That might be days, weeks, months ahead of when you're planning to implement a prescribed fire. It's typically done for smaller units as well. And one of the best tools that I have for screening is by using the B-Smoke model. I've got the link here and hopefully you'll get a copy of the presentations so you'll have that link. But if not, you could just, in Google, you can just do B-Smoke, um, I think just B-Smoke and it'll pop right up this link. So that is for planning and you get an output that looks kind of like this map over here on the right where you've got the plume for your worst case hour going um, to the northwest here. So for more complex modeling or for implementation, um, you would use some version of high split. So many of you have used high split before. You might even receive a trajectory high split modeling run output when you request your spot weather forecast from the National Weather Service. I'm not going to show an example of that today because um, that's a, a trajectory is a little different than dispersion, but it does give you where your smoke might end up going. I utilize Blue Sky Playground as well as PC High Split, and you can see down on the bottom right of your screen now an output from Blue Sky Playground that shows where the smoke might end up going, and this is an hour by hour as well as a 24 hour average um, throughout the day of what the smoke might look like. So it's a more complex model than V smoke. Um, I also utilize PC high split in lots of applications and that's uh, another output for that to show where the smoke is going each hour of the day. And from the folks that I work with um, in the Southern US, they are pretty pleased with these products and they think that it works really well for their applications. So that's for daytime. I've talked about um, you know, the, the modeling tools that are available on the web, uh, V-Smoke and Blue Sky Playground. Let's talk a little bit about nighttime smoke uh, and super fog screening. Now, many folks think that super fog is only a concern in Florida, um, but that's not true. It has happened in other states as well. It's happened in Kentucky and North Carolina, just documented cases, uh, North, um, Mississippi, Arizona, Oregon, um, and it could happen in Georgia as well. So I want to talk about how you can sim do a simple screening on whether nighttime smoke is a concern for you. And how, how we recommend doing that is using this NWCG Smoke and Roadway Safety Pocket Card. Um, it has just some general rules on the first couple pages about staying informed and monitoring communication and mitigation, but here the, the last couple pages is where it really gets into the meat of how to screen for nighttime smoke and super fog. So here's the thing, here are the questions that you need to ask yourself. Um, are you going to have active burning or smoldering after sunset? So many folks, you know, you get in, you get your burn done and you're, you're not really anticipating much smoldering at night, but if you are, and many of the larger burns we are anticipating smoldering, then we go on to the next question. Are there roadways within 10 miles of the fire? If yes, then continue. Now, I know a little bit about Georgia and I know a little bit about the South and it is hard to find an area that doesn't have roadways within 10 miles of any place we're at. 
So yes, continue. Can winds transport smoke towards the roadways? What are your nighttime winds looking like? If yes, continue. Um, do you have topographic features? Do you have drainages that can lead the smoke from the fire site to the road? Remember how, how I said that modeling and these screenings, they often confirm our best professional judgment based on our experience. So what are your drains? Where are you anticipating the smoke to go? So then, after we've answered those questions, if yes to all, then we get into looking at our forecast parameters. So during the nighttime hours for your worst case hour, you know, all these have to line up. Do you have a predicted low temperature of less than an equal to seven degrees Fahrenheit or less than or equal to 55 degrees Fahrenheit? So we, I talk about watch out and critical values. So if they're critical, it's less than 55 degrees Fahrenheit for the low temperature. If your predictive relative humidity is greater than 90%, it's critical. Um, if your surface wind speeds are less than or equal to four miles per hour, that's a critical value. And if your predicted cloud cover is less than 40%. So if all of these are lining up, if you have relatively clear skies, low winds, high humidity, and low temperatures, then and you're anticipating smoldering during the overnight hours, then super fog formation may be likely. And then what happens then? That's when we look at utilizing PBP mod to assess downwind risks and to provide a scope for you all for mitigation. So I just want to show another case study really quick. This was the I-95 super fog incident that took place on March 3rd of 2022. I was actually doing modeling up here in Asheville, North Carolina that day, but not for Florida. Um, and this was not actually a forest service or even a federal unit. It was uh, a pile burn that was nearby to the interstate, um, but there ended up being five accidents, 17 vehicles that were involved, and there were three fatalities involved. And this is just a, um, a picture of what, what it looked like, what that super fog looked like on the ground shortly after the accidents took place. So there wasn't a spot weather forecast for this burn because it was a private landowner. However, a nearby federal agency did request a spot forecast. And I took a look at the parameters here and I'm gonna screenshot them right now. I show them to you. So for that night, um, where the when that accident took place, was mostly clear skies. Um, you had temperatures around 54 degrees. You had 100% humidity, low winds, um, and then if you want to talk about the Lavori, the low visibility occurrence risk index, it was the worst it can be at a level of 10. So there were a lot. Uh, all of the parameters were really indicating that super fog was likely. So what I have been really focusing on in the last couple of years is telling the folks in the field, when you get a spot forecast, take a look at your nighttime conditions and are you, is super fog indicated? And it doesn't mean you can't burn, it's just taking a look at your parameters and taking a look at what are some mitigation factors, whether it's patrolling at night, putting out signs, things of that nature, letting the highway patrol know. Here's what an output of PVP mod looks like. Um, here is the push pin showing the location of a burn. And then the red dots are showing those locations where fog might be predicted and yellow where smoke might be predicted. In this case, because it's not really lining up with the, with the push pin with the location, this would not be one that I ha would have concern with, um, but it does, there's an R to reading the results, and you can find out more at this website here, P, uh, where you can find the PVP mod site. Pretty simple inputs. It takes about 15 minutes to run, and you get it right there on your desktop or your laptop. All right. So the second BSMP to talk about, just for I'm just going to talk for just a second, is monitoring. Um, after we've predicted using dispersion modeling of some sort. Um, where our smoke might go, we now need to observe where it actually is going. Is our model behaving? Is the smoke behaving as we predicted? 
um, and what the downwind concentrations are. And that can be done. You don't have to do it with mo monitors per se. You can do it with um, with photographs. You can do it with you know a log of some sort. But there are monitors that are available, um, and that would be some e-samplers. Um, we have some in the Southern Regional Office of the Forest Service. There's a cache of these that are also available for deployment. You can order them. Any um, state agency or federal agency can order from the cache any of these monitors. You can also purchase your own air quality sensors, these purple air sensors. And we have a unit here in the South that has just purchased a bunch of these to put out to their neighbors who were complaining about smoke, concerned about smoke, so to be proactive, they purchased these sensors at about $300 and set them out um, so that they can know real time what their potential impacts might be. So the last thing I want to talk about is sharing the airshed. Um, chances are that when it's a good burn day for you, it's a good burn day for your neighbors, it's a good burn day for another agency or a private landowner or a, or a um, a timber company or whoever it is that's doing burning near you. So it is really important not to overwhelm the airshed. Georgia State Smoke Management Program does a really good job at issuing permits and trying to um, preclude that from happening. Other states don't do as great a job, but it's important to share the airshed and make sure that your smoke is not going to exacerbate other issues. So you can communicate with each other, um, coordinate and plan ignitions, um, kind of stagger things, check your air quality forecast at the airnow.gov site. And then there's a couple of maps that you can take a look at. The hazard mapping system, many of you have seen before, um, has current fire and smoke detects, and that's what I'm showing right here. And then one I use pretty much all the time now is EPA's fire and smoke map. And that's a screenshot of today. Now it's rainy here in the south, so we have really good air quality. All of that Canadian wildfire smoke is not near us. So we have a sea of green, which is good air quality here. So all of those monitors, there are circles shown on your screen. Um, those circles are permanent air quality monitoring sites, typically operated by the states. And then the squares are those purple air sensors that I mentioned earlier, those purple air monitors where you can buy for you know, $300 and anybody can place them out. So you can see that we've got a really good air quality today, um, a few weeks ago, less so. So I hope that this has been helpful. And if you have any any questions, any if you want assistance or just wanna talk about any of the things I discussed today, please reach out. Um, at my email or at this uh, at my number, which is up there. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Eric or Mary Nell or whoever is in charge. Thank you. I think we might have time for one question, one question only. All right. But it doesn't look like there are any takers. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much again. And I will get that presentation to you, Eric. I wasn't able to put it on the box. I didn't have access. So I'm just going to email it to you. We do have a question. Oh, we we'll do. Oh, okay. Uh, on occasion, uh, I'm able to convince people to go to the website and register for the notifications of uh, prescribed firms. And that's a good thing. It's not uh, well known, at least in our community, and it's difficult to get people to register. Also, it doesn't, um, the one we have doesn't seem to interface since uh, the area I live in is up against North Carolina, it doesn't interface into across the border, which I could throw a rock and hit North Carolina. So it doesn't help the communities along the border. If that could be improved to make it more uh, friendly, first of all, more accessible to not only uh, government uh, agencies, uh, but the general public, it would save a lot of angst by the public not knowing when we have smoke, 
Most of the public is very willing to tolerate the smoke and welcomes it knowing that 1.4 million acres are prescribed burns, and that's great. But not knowing what the smoke is gives them some difficulty and not knowing whether to evacuate or what. So effective, first of all, be made more user friendly. The second, cross a state line to cross smoke, there's no border. And uh, people don't know where it's coming from. And the third thing is to have it as a lot of display as the weather displays come through with moving clouds with a forecast, which is probably well, maybe reasonably accurate, would be a great benefit to the public. And it might save a few phone calls. Thank you. Good points. Any other questions? None. Thank you, Melanie. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie.